Uh, well, welcome everybody um, to our panel discussion on election security. I'm Janine Jacobs. I am a senior consultant with NYSTEC. Um, we have, uh, have our, our panel here and we have a set of prepared questions to go through and we're going to do our best to leave some time uh, for questions from the audience. Um, so let's get started and uh, we'll have our panelists introduce themselves. Hi. All right. That is definitely loud enough. All right. Uh, ben Spear, uh, Chief Information Security Officer for the State Board of Elections. Uh, prior to that, I was the founding director of the Elections Infrastructure Information Sharing Analysis Center, or EIISAC, which was set up uh, by CISA and the Center for Ant Security uh, as a sister organization to the MSISAC, which I'm sure many folks here are familiar with, um, to serve as the lead cybersecurity support for state local uh, election offices. Um, if I look familiar, it's not because I've been here for the last nine years. It's definitely because you were at the My Pillow conference, and I was on the list of the cabal of Jews that stole the election. So, <laughs> thanks for joining me. Well, I, I don't believe I have ever made such a list, but perhaps there's time. Um, so, my name is uh, Mike Haber. Uh, I'm the Chief Information Officer for the New York State Board of Elections. Uh, fairly new to that role, just uh, started earlier this year in January. Prior to that though, I did spend uh, five years or so uh, doing project management overseeing technology projects at the State Board. Uh, it's been, uh, you know, been a very exciting time. I've, I've enjoyed working with the, uh, the State Board of Elections. Uh, we do have our own independent uh, IT shop there, separate from ITS, and the primary reason for that is simply that the Board of Elections is a bipartisan agency in New York State. So, you know, we are governed by a set of commissioners, and we'll talk more about the structure, I'm sure, as we go through the questions. Uh, but as a result, we try to keep ourselves as a, a wholly separate entity to the extent that's possible, just to avoid any uh, appearance of influence from uh, partisan appointees. But uh, excited to talk to you today, and uh, hope we give you some good information about elections. Hi, my name is Sean Murray, and I better back up a little too, huh? Uh, I am a senior principal consultant for NYSTEC, where I've worked for about 16 years. Uh, I manage the domain that does security testing and assurance, so I do a lot of testing, penetration testing, application security testing, and things like that. I have been assisting the New York State Board of Elections with the oversight of the security testing of voting systems since almost since the inception, since New York State began um, using electronic voting systems back in 2008 is when I joined. It started a little earlier than that. So um, NYSTEC has been assisting. We don't do the actual testing ourselves. That's done by a lab, but NYSTEC assists doing the oversight of the security testing, making sure that the the lab is doing the correct security testing and that the systems are working as they should be. Okay, so our, our first question is going to um, uh, just be about the basic voting process and try to give everyone here kind of an overview of how it works. So in New York State, um, our voting consists of hand-marked paper ballots that get scanned and collected. But beyond that, uh, how does one vote on one ballot make it to the final tally? Can someone walk us through that process? Yeah, yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to do that. Uh, so, right, you guys go, you, you fill out your Scantron, you, you put it in the machine. What happens after that point? Well, it, the machine counts it, that's one. At the end of the night, there's an entire process that the poll workers, and there's poll workers from both major parties, they have to be an equal number, it's, it's, um, and there's a chairman, et cetera, and they actually then have to go through a process of shutting down the system, turning off, ending the elect, closing the election is how it was called. They then print out a tape that actually has the, the, the counts, and they have to review that tape to the number of ballots, as well as to how many people were listed in the poll book as having voted that day. Um, there's also observers from the candidates in that election or from the major parties, something I did back in my youth, which I think based on how Tony described the year 2004 uh, is a long time ago now, which is concerning. Um, but um, but uh, uh, from there, uh, they're reviewing that. That is then um, signed off by both parties, both poll inspectors of, of the parties. 
uh, as a tally sheet. It is then transmitted with this paper copy as well as the memory cards from the voting machines uh, to the Board of Elections locally. That is then inputted into a system uh, locally and reviewed uh, as well as then um, exported uh, through it to a, uh, a file that can be put online uh, which is actually has to be carried separately because those systems are air gapped uh, and you don't have to tell me about air gap is not not connected but we can we can have that discussion as well um, I, but um, from there it uh, then posts online but then separately that's just the unofficial results, right? That is election night is what we call unofficial results. After that, there is then a further process where the Central Board of Elections of the county, again, with representatives of each candidate and each party present and both a Democrat and a Republican commissioner or, and deputy commissioners, uh, each reviewing the tallies of each machine, certifying that it matches the, the poll book, uh, and then it goes, and certifies that vote ultimately, so long as there's no discrepancies that they have to review. So it's a very <laughs> distinct process uh, that then has to be certified by the county and then certified by the state uh, as well. Uh, so that's a high level overview. Um, so with, with stories of recounts and audits and court cases all over the media these days, how do we know that our vote was, vote was counted in New York State? Like specifically, what procedures exist to ensure election um, accuracy? Um, Thank you. Looks like I'm on mute. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's a lot that happens to make sure everything gets counted properly. Um, you know, we don't really trust the machine to do the correct job because it is a computing device. It has got millions of lines of code. There may be bugs. There may be bugs that are showing wrong totals. There may be bugs that allow security in. So there's a bunch of processes beforehand and afterhand for each scanner that goes out to the polling place to make sure that it is working properly. There are test decks that with all the different bubbles filled in for the election of all the different types and they, they send them through and they make sure that it's counting accurately. Um, there are what they call hash checks that check that the firmware on the device is correct and those hash checks don't come off the device itself, they're, they're done externally. Sometimes you can remove the little memory card that's got all the firmware on it. Sometimes they just install new firmware each time and things like that. Um, so you're, there are physical locks and, and physical um, tamper evidence seals on the boxes to make sure nobody touches them. Um, and one of the biggest controls to make sure that these things are working correctly is what's called a 3% audit, meaning a random, 3% of the machines out there are gonna come in and be hand counted to make sure they're working correctly. And you know when you put all of these together along, and again, these machines are tested fairly well um, as far as security and that they're working and things like that before they're even certified in New York State, that they are counting the votes accurately. Um, there's no tampering behind the scenes. You know, As Ben said, there's, there's cash register tapes, we call them, register tapes that come out at the end of the polling place, then they get they get pushed on, you know, they're published on the wall of the polling place, and anyone can go look at them. Um, and it's also, they're also done behind the scenes with the cards. They get added up in the election management system behind the scenes, and those things are compared. So there is a lot of checks and balances to ensure that uh, every vote is counted. Anything to add? Um, so what about um, absentee ballots? Do absentee ballots introduce new risks and is it possible to track your absentee ballot in New York State? Well, I'll, uh, I'll begin to field that one and other folks can chime in. Uh, so uh, absentee ballots, of course, have been around for a long time. We've been using them here in New York for years and years and years. Um, it's worth pointing out there are some states in the United States that actually only vote through absentee ballot. Everybody in those states vote through absentee ballot. Um, here in New York, we, in 2020 onward, we've seen an upsurge in the number of absentee ballots that were used, of course. Uh, obviously, that was due to the pandemic. Um, and there are quite a few protections that are in place. So if somebody votes through absentee, there's comparisons that are made. Uh, 
to verify that they haven't voted through some other method or through absentee in more than one place. Um, one new thing that's happening uh, this year is that absentee ballots are being counted earlier in the process. One of the uh, uh, complaints that some folks had in uh, uh, prior years was that there seemed to be, you'd have the, elect the unofficial election nights as results as were discussed. So those results get uploaded uh, and then the absentee ballot results would come in after that. And of course, when you have a lot of people voting by absentee as we have in the last few elections, that can change some of the results. Uh, so legislation was passed this year so that absentee ballots are actually counted earlier in the process. Uh, again, it's all done to make sure that, uh, you know, if one person votes through absentee and then they show up at the polls, they're not going to be able to vote. Uh, so there are all those protections that are in place. Um, another I'll new just, thing this year is, as was mentioned. I'll, and I'll just add to that, that is a process that's ongoing today because we are now in the, in the lead up to an election where, so you can actually go twice or three times a week, your county board of elections is doing the counting of these absentee ballots and you can go and observe that. Um, that is something that is, that is ongoing. That is an excellent point to bring up. Uh, yeah, so if you feel motivated, head on down to your county board of elections when they're, when they're counting and you can watch the process. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention was uh, in regards to tracking. Uh, a new uh, piece of uh, uh, technology that, we're, that we've just started to implement for this election is absentee ballot tracking. So beginning with this election, anybody who votes through absentee ballot, who has requested an absentee ballot, will be able to go to uh, our website uh, at elections.ny.gov and you'll be able to go track your absentee ballot. You'll be able to see some information just as to was your ballot sent, uh, if you sent it back in, was it received, was it opened and counted, um, and is it out for, or is it out for a cure if there was something wrong with it? There's an opportunity, depending upon what that is, to contact the voter and try to resolve it. Uh, but the absentee ballot tracker, again, it's a new thing that's implemented, um, just, uh, again, a new piece of legislation that was recently passed. Uh, and we've had that uh, up and running. We actually started it and uh, put it up in April, but obviously absentee ballots hadn't really gone out at that point. Um, so that's kind of uh, what I wanted to say there. Did you have anything you wanted to add there? I, I do. I just want to add that you know, I, I'm, I'm always, I'm on the outside looking in. I do not work for any board of elections, county or state, or uh, although I do consult. Um, and people, I have, I'm very passionate about these voting things, as you can tell. And people always ask, why do we have absentee, blah, 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 blah. It's higher risk, blah, blah, blah. And the answer is, for me, um, there at least you have to allow servicemen to vote, serving overseas. You know, they're serving their country overseas. They got to be able to vote. And the only practical way they can vote is via absentees. And there's also people who cannot leave their house for medical reasons or whatever reason. So, you know, it's something that has to be dealt with, absentee ballot voting. Um, and all these, like you, you've heard the whole process, there's a lot of controls in place to make sure that those are counted and correctly maintained and, and there has to be. So that was just my two cents. Uh, all right, when we were, when circling back to our first question about kind of the process, um, you talked about there's county boards and the state board running the election. So can you give us a little overview of those roles? Yeah, well, I'll start off on that one. Um, so the State Board of Elections, uh, which was established in 1974, uh, June 1st, actually, we just passed our anniversary. How exciting. <laughs> um, and uh, it was established as a bipartisan agency, as I mentioned before. Uh, so most agencies in New York State have a commissioner appointed by the governor, uh, whomever the governor might be at that time. Uh, at the State Board of Elections, we have four commissioners two Democrats, two Republicans, each appointed, uh, selected by the, uh, the caucus, the respective caucus in one of the houses of the legislature. Uh, and they provide overall governance from there. Uh, from there, that kind of trickles down into each of the units within the uh, State Board of Elections. So we have two co-executive directors, for example, a Republican and a Democrat. We have a Democrat and a Republican who co-supervise the election operations unit, likewise for the public information unit, for two sets of lawyers, and so forth. 
Uh, so it's all very bipartisan throughout the, uh, the state board there. Similarly, at the county board of elections, there are two commissioners, one Republican, one Democrat, uh, who oversee operations at the, uh, the county boards. So that bipartisan uh, oversight and day-to-day -day operational control is very key in trying to maintain balance and make sure that things are all on the up and up and, and fair in the elections. Did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, and I think the, I think the big piece, right, is, is that the state board of elections does not run an election, right? So we, we really, our job is to sort of lay out the rules of the road and ensure, and the rules of the road are really laid out by the legislature in the election law. Um, so all that process I told you about how to vote a count, count a vote, you can find that all. It's actually step by step how an election is run in New York State is legislated by law down to what can be written on a piece of paper or, or how this document can be moved from this table to that table. Um, it's really d distinct. And so our job is to really serve as uh, guidance and advisors to the counties and ensure the counties are complying with the law in that way. And the counties are the ones that actually right, conduct the election. There's some parts that we do have a role in, in terms of we maintain the voter registration system. Uh, we are responsible for certifying voting systems that, that come into the state. Um, and then also, um, at this time of year in state and federal elections where there's overlapping districts. Um, so normally folks would file their petitions with the county board of elections where it's overlapping. We're responsible for reviewing and approving those petitions and we're actually doing that. That's why it's just the IT guys this week and not any of our elections folks um, because it is both due to the special election uh, filing week for, for the special election as well as already it was originally the filing for independent petitions for November. So busy week in, in, in elections for sure. And then on top of that, of course, there was all the, the redistricting that you may have heard about in the news. We did redistricting uh, based on the census a few months ago. And then of course, those districts were uh, challenged in court, the challenge won. And so there are new districts, which we've been implementing. And that's actually what I've been working on all morning prior to coming here. But hence, as Ben said, our operations folks uh, would have loved to have been with us, I'm sure, because there's nothing they love more than talking to a bunch of IT folks. Uh, but sadly, they could not be, so they, uh, they left it to us. All right. I, I, I just want to add, again, my two cents from the outside <laughs> looking in. These poor county boards of election have been undergoing an incredible amount of strain these last few years. Uh, the state has passed more laws changing elections in the last few years than it has in the previous 30 or 40, I think. You know, with early voting, um, you know, and the redistricting, redistricting, as we heard, and the read the way uh, mail-in ballots are being counted differently. All those are big changes. You know, and when the legislator passes them, they don't look like big changes, but they are. You know, you got to make sure the systems can handle that. You got to write the procedures to make sure that's done securely and correctly. So there have been a lot of changes. Um, and it's a thankless job. You know, there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of rumor about how elections work and things like that. So, I, you know, I just want to add, give your, give your poor county boards of election a break because they really, really deserve it. All right. Um, so let's get into the good stuff. This is why you're here. Let's start talking about security and hacking. <laughs> um, so it, it's been in the news a lot about election hacking and baseless claims of voter fraud. So should New York State be concerned about vulnerabilities in our election infrastructure? I think, you know, it's certainly something that folks are always, you know, concerned about. I, I think we're doing a pretty good job here. Um, New York is really considered a bit of a leader in this, you know, even before I was in my previous role, uh, we did a lot of work with New York in particular um, in sort of taking, you know, a, a, a proactive approach in identifying where the risks are and addressing them. Um, so there's actually money out there that the federal government has issued over the last several years in various grants for election security. And New York has taken those to, one, bring the counties and their IT directors together for uh, exercises, uh, but also then to implement a number of initially directives and then ultimately the regu regulations uh, that, in, that require a variety of typical cyber hygiene and, and basic controls in place. Uh, to secure the, the election environment. Um, and with that also came additional funding for grants to, to actually 
put those controls in place. And so we've developed a great relationship with Nice Glitta, uh, great relationship we already have with our election commissioners, um, depending on the day. Um, but uh, working with them to be able to really implement this across the board um, and ensure that no matter what level, size of your organization, we're working with you to ensure that um, those systems are as secure as possible. And I think the other part and component I mentioned earlier, 100% an air gap is not unconnected um, and we do have certainly strong recommendations for securing that air gap, if you will. Um, but the primary systems, the election management system, where the ballots are designed, where the votes are tallied, et cetera, are systems that sit in most places in a closet with a lock door with each the Democrat and the public, again, have a key, separate keys to you know, unlock them in many cases. Um, uh, and so uh, the tamper evidence seals that were mentioned uh, prior. And so there's a lot of pro places in the process, mitigations that are in place. There's always going to be risk. It's what are we doing to address that? And I, I think that New York's done a, a fairly good job and continues to, to do a good job on that front. Um, there's something else I'm saying. I forget now. But let's see if Sean. Well, uh, I mean, I'll just throw in in terms of uh, there's separate from that, you know, from the, the voting machines themselves, there is, of course, you know, we have our, our IT infrastructure at the, at the state board uh, as each county has their IT infrastructure. Um, and that's infrastructure that's going to be more familiar to a lot of the folks who are here at this conference. You know, there's, there, are, there are servers, virtual and physical. There are firewalls. And there's all those kinds of protections that we have. We have uh, a lot of uh, industry-leading protections. Uh, we do log analysis. We work with partners. We are frequently in touch with uh, both state and federal agencies about potential risks uh, in that regard. So all of that kind of protection is done um, much the way you would expect it, much the way it would be in, in most robust IT jobs. Um, but I think, uh, Sean, did you have anything you wanted to say about the EMS? I, you know, I think, uh, I'd like to say that voting itself is a really fascinating security problem because it's like the only uh, system where you cannot audit it. Nobody is allowed to know how you voted. Um, you know, if you, if you put a mark on your ballot and you know, put your name on it or something, that invalidates your ballot because um, in New York State, again, nobody is allowed to know how you vote. That's what stops you know, people from buying votes because once they get into the polling place, who the heck knows how you voted? So that's a big key because you cannot audit the system as you could audit almost any other system, especially like a financial system or any other high risk system. You audit things, you got logs, who did what, who logged in, who came up, blah, blah, blah. None of that can happen on election day. So that's why a lot of these controls are in place. It's like, how do we, you know, how do we get past all these risks to make sure this thing is actually counting correctly, not you know, let alone that somebody hacked it, that it's just counting correctly. And that's why you've got the test decks, you're checking uh, the firmware on there that it's correct, and, and all of these other controls that are in place because they have to. You know, you, you assume that this thing is gonna fail. We, we test the best, and I think New York State does some of the best testing in the country for voting machines. Um, and we test, 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 test before they even get certified, but they're complex. It's, it's, it's more complex than you would think it would be, and therefore there's gonna be flaws, there's gonna be bugs, and you put all of these controls before, during, and after these elections to make sure that everything worked properly. And you know the thing about voting on paper is worst comes to worst, you can hand count all the ballots. A follow-up question: um, Can you explain a little bit more about how the Board of Elections provides oversight for these um, for certifying these voting systems? Yes, yes, we can. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll I guess I'll speak generally about it. Um, you know, if a so there are uh, there are standards uh, that exist at the federal level that every voting system has to meet. In New York, we have more rigorous standards uh, that have to be met by any system before it can be allowed to be used here in New York. Um, so what the state board does, as, as has been mentioned, that the county board is really oversees the individual elections. The state board provides certification 
for any election system and for several other types of systems such as voter registration systems used at the local level. We, we provide approval for that. So if you were, if you had a, a voting system and you wanted it to be available for counties in New York to buy, to, to roll out at their uh, poll sites, then you need to go to the State Board of Elections and follow the process that we have. Uh, and I won't speak too much about that. I mean, Sean knows that process extremely well because he's been doing it for a very long time, um, or at least overseeing it. So it's uh, that process uh, at the state board essentially is you, you're giving us the, the hardware, you're giving us copies of the software, you're having it run through uh, one of the, the national testing labs. We're reviewing those results. We're reviewing how the testing was done. We're asking questions. We're going through a lengthy process. And then at the end of that, it's up to our, we'll submit a report. The state board will submit a report to the commissioners and the commissioners will decide. They could decide, as they have in the past, that now they just are not completely satisfied with allowing this system. Uh, they and all of us at the state board and everyone that we work with really do take it seriously to make sure that these systems are going to have as many controls and protections in place and that the testing is done properly. Any, anything to add? All right. Guess we're good. Um, okay. Um, so with all that said, um, will, will there ever be a time when we move away from paper ballots? I mean, we have so many advances in cloud technologies, public blockchain. I mean, just the amount of things I can do on my cell phone on a daily basis. Who makes that decision and do you think we'll ever get away from paper ballots? Talk to the people at the end of the concourse. Um, that's up to them. <laughs> Uh, so the, the, it's the, it's, it really is up to the legislature ultimately um, what the voting process and what systems are 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 allowed in, to that degree, right? So right now, New York State, we have paper ballots, um, it, which is a very effective tool for auditing and, and the like. Um, and additionally, um, uh, we do require the full face of the ballot to be visible to the voter. That's a, um, an important factor and is involved in, in tabulating as well. So, you know, there's some systems out there now that write count off a barcode or, or something like that, not something that, that, that is currently under the law allowed. Um, and so uh, what that looks like in 10 years, I mean, there's certainly a lot of uh, conversation and questions about things. There's um, Bradley Tusk and his gang want to do blockchain voting and things like that. Um, but um, Right now in New York, it's you know we are paper, and, and if it's going to change, it's going to it's going to happen down the hall there, and and certainly we're not the best suited to answer that question if it really leans on them for the ultimate decision. No, if I have my way, uh, which I don't. <laughs> I mean, <they're> not. <laughs> so uh, there's a couple things. Um, you know, there there can be what they call DREs, direct recording equipment, where you go and you push the button, it counts it up, they print out the registered tape, and, and that's your, you know, that's your vote. Um, they exist. They do not exist in New York State, um, but voting on paper has got a lot of advantages. Um, the first one being, like I said earlier, everything goes south. You got the ballots as long as you're protecting the ballots and all this process. You have those. You can count them by hand. You can run them through another scanner. There's a lot of things you can do at that point. The second one is, you know, let's say there's great technologies out there that can do, you know, great voting and bus and blat and the other thing. A lot of people say, oh, why don't we use blockchain? You know, blockchain doesn't really help uh, any of the problems that voting has. You know, the anonymity that you need and things like that, or how you voted and all that other type of thing. Um, but even if you could come up with this great encryption, it does this, you can see that your vote was counted and blah, 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 blah. I still think that's not a great system because no one understands it. And people, including myself, aren't going to really understand, you know, if they don't understand how the thing works, that it does this, it does this encryption and some great algorithm and blah, 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 and it can be guaranteed, people aren't going to trust it. You know, people, it's, it's just very easy to understand a paper ballot. You fill it out, you put it in, it counts it. And, you know, it's just that makes it that much easier. So I, I'm a big advocate for, for ballot voting. And there's systems, what they call a, a VVPAT, a verifiable paper trail, voter verifiable paper trail. So you can do a DRE, it spits you out a little tape 
uh, that you can read behind a piece of glass. It tells you how you voted. You look at it and you say, yeah, that, that gets dumped into a, a bin just like a, a ballot would be. And again, you can audit the system that way. You can look at all of those to make sure everything was added correctly. I'm not a fan of that personally. Um, it's hard looking at that. It's very different looking at how you voted. You're under the pressure there of someone's behind you in line. You know, the nice thing about filling out a ballot is also as well, you can have 50 people doing it at 50 booths in your voting area and only have a handful of scanners. So, you know, you don't have the pressure of being in line and people behind you. You got this booth and no one's waiting for you. You can take your time, you can fill out your ballot, you can make sure you do it correctly. So, um, I'm an advocate of paper ballots. And again, it's not up to me. I don't make these decisions. I'm not even close to that. but. If, if you ask me, that's, that's how I feel. Um, have, have there ever been any hacking attempts on the New York State election system? It wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to answer me? Um, well, I'll, I'll start with it uh, just to say that, <clears throat> you know, on our... So again, I, I do want to draw some distinction between the, the technologies we're talking about. There are the, the voting systems. The, the machines. If you voted in New York State, you fill out your Scantron sheet and you feed it in to a ballot counter. There are those systems which have all kinds of protections and which we've talked a lot about. There is separate equipment, you know, standard infrastructure that we have, again, at the state level and as any office would have, and things that are similarly, there are such systems at the, uh, the county levels. We are scanned every day um, and with IP addresses from all over the world, domestic and foreign, um, there are always attempts to, to probe and to see where there may be vulnerabilities uh, in our networks. Um, so, you know, we're conscious of that and as I mentioned before, we have, we have all kinds of uh, protections in place and obviously I'm not going to go into exquisite detail on them. That would be silly. Um, but we do certainly have those attempts to see if there are openings and to break in. And just like any, any office, whether it's a, a government agency or whether it's a, a private company, uh, we're always cautious about malware. We're giving education to our employees about how to, how to protect, how to be suspicious of, of emails and links um, and all the protections that uh, many of you have, have undoubtedly encountered in your in your professional lives as well. Uh, one of the things that I'm very uh, pleased with for the time that I've been with the, the State Board in my current role and previously is that we've really upped our game in terms of providing support to the counties as well. Uh, counties are often small, underfunded agencies. They don't always have a lot of uh, IT support depending upon the county. They don't always have a lot of funding. We've been able to, uh, because of the heightened interest in election security, we've been able to provide some security benefit to the counties over the last several years, providing them with, with systems that uh, to help to protect uh, intrusion attempts, uh, both uh, monitoring logs and actually stopping in real time, depending upon the circumstances. Uh, we funded a risk assessment for every county board of elections, uh, and then after that, we funded a uh, remediation plan uh, where each county met with cyber advisors who helped them develop, all right, these were your, your issues that we found, here's how we're going to respond to them. And we put money behind it. Uh, counties get all kinds of mandates from the state level on a regular basis. There's not always actual money behind it. That's why we're, we're their favorites right now. So if you were wondering, yes, you can buy your friends. Um, but the county boards have definitely uh, uh, become more secure over the last few years, and I'm very pleased with that. Yeah, I mean, I, again, there, as you all know, there's attacks every day, generally, that we can, you know, but are they successful? Not necessarily. The one thing we, we do see has happened um, is there have been attacks on other parts of a county, um, sometimes during the election period, not necessarily affected the Board of Elections, but still creates some heartache when you think about it. Um, but, but again, these processes are in place in so many ways, um, even before we had computers and whatnot, um, you know, the boards of election are required to have a full disaster recovery and, and, and coup plan or how to run their election if everything, you know, happened. You know, I always like to say, right, 
election day. Superstorm Sandy, election day. Um, we, we've got this. Um, you know, that's, that's ultimately what it comes down to. You know, and getting back to the voting systems themselves, uh, hacking one of those would be a very, very difficult process. Um, I almost say that you'd have to have some kind of uh, complicit insider working with you. And as we spoke before, since everything is bipartisan, you probably have to have bipartisan complicit uh, help on the inside. Uh, you know, it's changing something. You know, again, there's nothing networked here. They're only networked together. You can't access the, ele the election management system. It is none of these scanners can, are allowed to be networked. That's one of the things that gets tested as when voting systems are tested, that they cannot be networked at all. Um, so you, you need the physical access, get past the physical access controls that are in place, uh, somehow figure out how it all works, you know, if you get source code or if you can change the configuration or whatever you'd have to do, um, and then somehow cross your fingers to make sure that scanner never gets audited because it's a random audit and you just never know if that's going to happen. So you're, you'd always be at risk of getting caught doing it because the, the random audit, when someone takes the ballots out and hand counts them and it doesn't match the number that counted in this thing, then, then you're caught. So uh, my guess would be no. Uh, I, I, I have a lot of confidence that these systems, um, you know, the effort to do something like that and you know the the larger the the race you know if there's more scanners involved if it's a you know a statewide race if it's a you know a senate race or um, you know something like that that goes across counties then you'd have to get the counties involved or you know maybe you're smart enough you can say well you know this is the pivot district if i can you know get these three machines uh, very 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 difficult mountain to climb possible yeah you always say i am i'm an old security guy you always say it's possible um, you just think and you go, okay, what's, what's, what's the, someone going to have to do to try to uh, manipulate these election systems to get a result that you'd want to get? And, you know, from my standpoint, you'd, you'd have to have insider, compl you know, complicit somewhere. Do states share information about voting system threats? You want to take that one, Ben? Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so yes, um, that was my entire job for four years. Um, and actually, we have a great example on this last week. Um, CISA released an advisory about um, vulnerabilities in a particular voting system that's used in a very small number of states um, and where those issues are mitigated by a number of the items that we've sort of delineated um, earlier. Um, but it, it does happen. Um, there's a great collaboration, both um, the ISAC being one piece of that, where there's all 50 states and 3,000 local election offices that are members, and they are sharing information. On election day itself, there's a live room where they're, they're talking about threats. Um, we work very closely with the various FBI field offices in New York State. We also have a daily um, briefing call or, or run sheet that we work through. Uh, with our state and federal partners. Uh, very strong partnership with CISA. CISA's really taken the lead on this um, in terms of, of identifying those issues. Um, but it's a, it's a very um, well-oiled machine in terms of, of folks reporting something, identifying if other folks are seeing it, uh, and then sharing that out with the rest of the community. Um, because that, and that's a very important part of, of that role. Um, but also, um, now that there, that does exist, folks who are aware of something and are in that community know where to go. So we have cases like last week's report where a researcher provided that information um, and we were able to get that information out to the, those that are affected. Um, and that is, some, that is a process that, that continues um, every day, every month, um, because there's not just an election in November or in June or in August. There's, there's, if it's the Tuesday in America, there's an election happening somewhere. Um, and so, and there's, you know, a potential risk or threat that could be seen here that might affect somebody else there down the road. And so uh, that's something that, that is very much strongly in place. Um, and we, we contribute greatly to that as well on our own as New York. Okay, so my last question, um, what are some of the biggest challenges that the State Board of Election faces with efforts to instill confidence in this election process? So, you know, there's so much misinformation that prolif proliferates online. Like, how, how do you go about making sure voters are confident when they come to vote in New York? 
So for me, it's panels like this. Um, you guys taking the first step to come here and find out how it works. Uh, and that's, uh, I, so often the, the conversation is, you know, misunderstanding of how the process works. And like I said, it's all available in, in 500 pages of election law and 200 pages of regulation. Uh, or if you just go to your, if you go to your uh, board of election or become a poll worker, I encourage you all to be a poll worker. I know one of you in here has been a poll worker, uh, at least uh, multiple. There we go. I know, I know two. So, you know, so, so I strongly encourage you to, to engage in the process. And now that you've been here and understand and hear, heard what we've had to say, share that with your friends, share that with your family, share that with your coworkers. Um, information, um, misinformation can only be countered with, with good information. Uh, and the sooner we get that good information out, the better um, is what we've found in, in terms of that. So. Yeah, and I don't think I could put it any better than that. Um, but I'll just you know reiterate, openness in the process is, uh, is, is key to this. Uh, the election law is, well, it reads like any, any group of laws. You know, you, unless you're a lawyer, you probably, and maybe even if you are, you know, you don't necessarily stay awake when reading election law. Um, but it's all spelled out there. Uh, hopefully, you stayed awake during this. Hopefully, you stayed awake during this, yes. <laughs> uh, the, the openness in the process is key. So, so go observe when, you're, when your county boards of elections are, are counting ballots. Go to those public processes. Become a poll worker, like Ben said. Uh, understand the process. Understand how it works. And you'll see that there are so many steps, so many uh, processes and technologies involved to, to prevent something from going awry. And if something did, to, to catch it and quickly resolve it. Uh, I think that the truth of it is really what uh, is the best thing we have going for us, is that it really is a, a robust process and a difficult one. If you really, really wanted to, to sway a large election, it is nearly impossible. And, you know, I, John doesn't like to use the word the impo impossible because, and he's right, you know, any technology can be compromised if you have unfettered access for enough time and enough knowledge. Uh, but it would be extremely, extremely difficult. So become involved and, uh, you know, read up on things. If there's something that you think is questionable as to how something is done, find out about it. Go contact your county board and ask them. Uh, they more than likely will be happy to, to explain, explain to you what they actually do. Yeah, and a lot of this you can go watch. You know, you can go watch them open the polls, and there's a whole procedure they go to where they're going to open the ballot box, show you that the ballot box that sits underneath the scanner is empty at the poll start. They run a zero tape to show that it's, they don't, no one's voted yet, that all the counts are zero. And at the end of the night, the same thing. They, you know, there's a whole procedure, there's a whole list of procedure that they go through where they print the, the tape out, and it gets recorded, and it gets hung on a wall, and you can go watch it. It's all public. And the counting uh, of uh, mail-in ballots is also, you know, most of that is public. Obviously, it's, it's done by the county, so it's, you know, it's up to them to, you know, to figure out how all that's done. But you're allowed to go and see and see it see it in action because that's what elections need to be transparent. Okay, so now it's time. <laughs> we do have some time for some questions. So Ben's going to walk around with a mic. Thank you. So um, I'm Ruth Walter. I'm a former county legislator in Westchester. So I've been through three elections myself, and I've been to the um, opening of absentee ballots, and it's extremely meticulous. And I have to say, you know, it's going well. Uh, so I'm also the chair of the Cybersecurity Task Force in Westchester now. Um, and I have three questions for you that are tech-based. The first is, um, we just saw the FBI talking about the vulnerability of thumb drives, which is something that we do use in Westchester County. The second question is electronic poll books, which I have been to many, many meetings to hear that the machines are not connected to the internet, <laughs> and yet these poll books obviously are using public Wi-Fi. Um, and I, that's a problem for, for me. Um, and then the final is the um, ballot marking devices. So machines that can, um, after you've cast your ballot, 
they pass underneath the print head. And so there's a lot of activists out there who are concerned about these machines. We did purchase them in Westchester County. Um, not the entire, uh, the entire set of machines, but I was wondering if you could address those three questions. Thanks. Uh, the first one was the thumb drives. I'll take I'll take that one. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Absolutely. The the these procedures when a voting system gets certified, there's these procedures that um, the board of elections has to write, and very often they write them or with our assistance because we helped with the testing. And when you're using a thumb drive that's going to be put into the device, it has to be wiped. Um, and there's certain standards. There's hardware that you know is approved to wipe these drives. So if it's going you know, what, what I'll say is outside the system, um, and the system is the voting system. Again, there's an ele election management system that's probably on its own little network, which is not connected to anything, but these computers speak to each other. And there's the scanners and the other devices, and they go in between those. And if there's ever, if you ever have to go outside that, which you do occasionally, um, ballots have to be printed, so you get PDFs from the election management system to go print that. They they have to be cleaned, and they have to be cleaned well. And there's a certain, I believe, there's a set of uh, devices that are approved to do those things. You can do them on a computer as well, but the. The preferred methodology is you take one of these devices, which is you know, a piece of hardware, you stick it on there, you push the button, and it goes through and, and it cleanses every piece of memory on the thing to help keep it clean. So it's absolutely an issue. Um, it's tedious, you know, especially in a large county, to, to do those types of things, but that's, that's the fix for those. Um, you know, what the risk is for that, it's hard to say. You know, whether you can, you know, if you can put something on there that it's, you know, some piece of executable software that's going to run and put a virus on there and, you know, something like that. That's not easy to do, but absolutely certainly possible, which, which is why you cleanse them. So that's the thumb drive issue, and it, and it is thought of. If it ever, like I said, if it ever goes into outside the trusted, what I call the trusted system, it's got to be cleansed before it's put back in. And uh, I guess the second question was about e-poll books, right? And... Uh their connection, they don't connect through Wi-Fi, but they are connected through uh, wireless systems. Um, and so e so, books, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not completely fully versed on our, because that's our operations team, um, but, but generally the e books usually have their own Wi-Fi network that they are running on, and that network is then connected either through a hard wire locally or, or via MiFi or something like that. And the connection between the home office and the county board of elections and that network has a security, you know, whether VPN or, or something like that, between those two to ensure that there's, there's that. Um, and then on the BMDs, um, as of right now, there is no BMD that is certified in the state of New York to actually be used. Um, and so I, there's nothing I can, in terms of, you know, the, huh? Are those BMDs though? Or there's a the Oh, do they? Okay, I thought the I they thought they were there has to be BMDs. Oh, well, there's BMDs for accessibility purposes, but not for but not for regular voters, I don't think. Right. They're using them in early voting. Are they using them in early voting? Okay. Okay. Well, I excuse me for my mistake. They're using the ice, is that Quite what you said there. across? Um, but certainly um, I mean one of the things I think I mentioned it cuz there's one of the issues with the system that last week the, that that um, CISA released that alert on. Um, one of the big things with with the BMDs in New York is, is what I mentioned, the requirement for the full face ballot. And so it's not something where it's reading off a barcode. So in other states, it reads a barcode and literally just prints line by line, this person voted this, this, and this, this is the candidates. You know, in New York, that BMD printout still looks exactly like the ballot that you print out and fill out with it. Um, and so we do have that as sort of the, the, the a way to sort of protect against the concerns there, um, particularly. And I can talk about the, uh... The ICE, the ICE is a particular uh, piece of hardware by ESNS, right? Dominion, I'm sorry, it's a Dominion box. And it acts as a, a BMD as a ballot marking device, so someone can go up and if they're visually impaired, they can get a pair of headphones and they can put in their entries, it walks them through the whole ballot, it prints it out, They've got a, it looks like a regular ballot that everyone else has used. They take that over, they put it in a scanner, and they vote. Um, the ICE machine does both. It does that. It is a ballot marking device, so there is a printer in there, and it's also a scanner. And the issue with it is that there's a single paper path, and it is an issue. 
um, that in theory that someone could, you know, I could go and I could mark my ballot, I stick it in there, and this thing can sense, hey, you know, this guy didn't vote for governor. I'm going to go ahead and use my printer and fill that in. And then, you know, then count it and then drop it in the ballot box. So if there's any audit afterwards, it's like, oh, yeah, it's filled in. Um, possible, yes. Practical, it's hard to say. Um, they, they mitigated that. After, after it was certified in New York, they had a mitigation in it where there's a separate print counter of how many things went through the printer. Um, there's, you know, someone would have to realize it. I mean, it's a printer, it's an inkjet printer. You hear the thing going. If it's going to print, you know, again, you'd, not, you'd have to do it without getting caught, which is always the hard part. Um, someone would have to realize that what's going on with this thing? It's making noise. You know what I mean? It sounds like it's printing, you know, even though I just cast my ballot. Um, so you'd somehow have to hope that nobody really recognizes that, that it's printing on your ballot. But absolutely, it's, it's an issue. Um, and, you know, the, the vendor and, and New York State have done their best to mitigate it to make sure it doesn't happen. Um, but it's, it's a bad design. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it. I'm, I'm not a fan of it myself. But I, I, I can say that because I do not work for New York State. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if anybody saw. I'm going I'm to keep going on. Uh, there was a device that, that CISA, or CISA, whatever it's pronounced, just came up with a, a uh, announcement, a vulnerability announcement for a uh, piece of hardware called the ICX, same vendor. Um, and this is uh, not certified in New York State, this thing, but it's got a whole list of vulnerabilities, um, none of which surprise me because it's probably, at least some of them would have been caught in New York State testing, but I'm not surprised a lot of them did not get caught in federal testing, which is not as rigorous as New York State testing. But, and then they had a whole list of, well, this is what you got to do to get past it. And you read down that list, and it's like, yeah, we do every one of these in New York State, except the ones that are specific to that device. So it was good to see. You know, again, the idea is that, yeah, this thing may fail. It may fail security-wise. It may fail because it's got a bug in it, whatever. And we put all these other procedures around it to make sure if it's failed, it at least gets caught and investigated. Um, yes, I have a question. Um, with the issue with Iowa in the primary, the presidential election that happened there with, uh, with uh, Bernie Sanders and Buttigieg and uh, all that, it took forever, I think weeks or something. With their system there, is their system in New York State, you know, do you do the testing, test data to make sure that something like that never happens here? So, so I'll start by saying that actually, the, so the Iowa caucuses are not run by the election authorities in the state of Iowa. They're actually run by the party. So the Democratic Party made a phone app that was usable for that. So that is something that we would not have a role in. Um, so that, that particularly there. I'm certainly right. If anything, where there is an election system that is in use in, in our jurisdiction and there's an error and you know, those are things, uh, there's the Election Assistance Commission, which is the federal body that, that sort of creates those guidelines. And actually, for instance, there was an anomaly in Tennessee in, a, in an election recently, and they actually do a full analysis and will provide a report out where those anomalies exist and why that happened and, and how it's been mitigated or addressed or can be mitigated or addressed in the future. Um, but in, in cases like Iowa, that was actually a, a, a party-run election, so the board does not have any sort of role in that directly. Got okay. One more. We're right this at 11.55, uh, yeah. so will be our You're last right question. Okay. Thank you. First one. Um, first, how did you sway the election away from Trump? Kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but in 2016, there was a lot of chatter about Russian interference. I heard you saying that the scanners are not networked, so therefore they cannot hack the scanners, correct? Well, yeah. Is that your only question? Or? That's correct. That's correct. The so, scanners so cannot. The, the scanners cannot be networked. Right. Um, there's, they're they're tested to make sure there's no network yeah. connectivity on the thing. If there is a Ethernet port on something, it's got to be dis, It's got to be, be removed disabled or disabled or usually disconnected. It'll might still be there, but it doesn't work. If I'm country X, I wanna. Sorry. If I'm country X and I want to interfere in the election to sway it some way or around, where would that be in the process? Not going to tell you, but uh, what I will tell you is that um, in in 2016, where that 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 interference was happening was actually the voter registration systems. So it wasn't the uh, the voting systems; it was the roles of who's allowed to vote that 
um, were targeted, um, and that was sort of uh, uh, you know the area of concern. But again, when you let's say they had not just taken the voter registration system roles of a few counties in Illinois, which is the extent of what happened, um, there is still the process of 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 affidavit ballots. Um, so if you go to, let's say they had, they, had, they had modified the roles and decided, oh, you know, we changed this voter to be a Democrat and they were Republican, or we removed them completely. When that voter goes to vote and they don't show up in the, in the book, they are allowed to then vote an affidavit ballot. And then that ballot goes back to the Central Board of Elections at the county, and the county will determine if that person was actually an eligible voter and may be able to determine then that, oh, something happened to our, our roles here if this person was previously registered and, and be able to address that. So there are, everywhere there's a paper, everywhere there's a paper trail that somehow uh, makes it available to, to, to work. So I think that is it, Janine, right? Yep, and that's it for our panel. I wanna thank our panelists here for a great discussion and thank you guys for attending. <laughs>